Good afternoon, everybody. It's 1.30 and we're about to start our, um, our session, our webinar on clinical trial designs, thinking outside the box. Uh, very happy to see so many participants having mm -hmm. uh, registered for the, for the symposium or for the webinar. Uh, my name is Gabe Sonke. I'm a medical oncologist at the Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam. Uh, I'm both an uh, uh, MCCR alumnus and I served at the early career investigators at ERTC. And I'm, I'm very happy to have two excellent speakers to guide you through some of the challenges and pitfalls and, and ideas on, on this topic, on clinical trial designs. And we have Daniela Morales from Spain, Barcelona, who will lead you through. But I think we'll start first, first with Paolo Bossi but not before we give the floor to uh, Vasilis Golfinopoulos, uh, director at the ERTC headquarters, who is so kind to, uh, to host this session and uh, to spend a few words with you on ERTC and on the value of international collaboration. Vasilis, I think you're there and happy to give the floor to you for a couple of minutes. I'm here, thanks for the, for the invitation. Uh, I understand that uh, you are eager to move on with your session. Uh, ERTC is the organizer of this uh, technically, so uh, it's the usual case that the organizer gets the opportunity to do a shameless plug of what they are doing. So I will not bother you with that. I will only show you very, very few things that I think you should keep in your mind while you're doing the rest of the, of the discussion. So sharing the screen, for a few things. Obviously, you're welcome. These are the core values of URTC, and I don't want you to, to care very much whether they are the core values of URTC or not. Uh, I'm showing them to you because I think they are pretty nice values to have in your scientific lives anyway, in your research. Okay, it's, it's good to strive for excellence, not to cut corners at least not mindlessly cut corners, know what you are doing. It's nice to be a little bit rigorous, uh, not sloppy in your research, to have integrity, have uh, an awareness of your incentives and uh, why are you doing what you are doing. Try to be inclusive both for your colleagues and collaborators and the patients that you put in your clinical trials and try to to think independently, something that is very easy to say and incredibly difficult to do in a world where they, we get inputs from everywhere. Okay, but keep all them in mind, and it, it's a usual, it's a useful compass to have to check from time to time and and see how you fare against these these values. The second thing I will show is the the some aspects of your RTC again. I am showing that not to show what the RTC is doing, but it's useful for you to think that when you are planning research, you all have a specialty. You're radiation oncologist, medical oncologists, surgeons, um, diagnostic doctors. Think of your colleagues of neighboring specialties, and that would most probably improve your research. When you are doing, uh, when you're planning research of one tumor type, think of the treatment modality or the situation of other tumor types that might help you understand what is happening or might help you expand your research. Uh, try to think of colleagues abroad, overseas. Don't necessarily limit the work to what you have available in front of you. Uh, the last I'm not sure you should always think about, try to keep a standard of research that will make the results of the research useful and usable. Sometimes we have trials that beyond the publication, they have trouble moving the field, moving the guidelines. So keep it in the back of your mind, not in the front of your mind. Leave people like the ones working at the RTC to keep it in the front of their mind, but just have a little bit idea that this exists and you should be careful about it. Last point, ERTC has members. You're all invited to be members. We uh, try to be inclusive in terms of countries. So many, many countries, many specialties, medical oncologist is the majority, still less than half of the of our investigators. And what you probably care about, I will show you the structure of our membership. 
What you care about is this box over here on the bottom left, what we call early career investigator. Our definition of early career investigator is an oncologist, surgeon, radiotherapist, somebody who who is over with the specialty and certified to treat patients within the first 10 years of acquiring their certification. OK, they have certain benefits like mandatory inclusion in our protocols, separate meetings for them. So think about it. There is an option that exists. OK, before your certification, we have a box called Young Investigator that cannot yet be formal independent investigators in our trials, but they can be there and attend proceedings and see whether this is for them or this is not for them. So I hope that was short. That was it. Enjoy your meeting. Thank you so much, Fazilis, for this uh, this introduction to ERTC. Very brief, but also again, thank you for ERTC for organizing the webinar. Uh, we'll move on to Paolo Bossi. Paolo is medical oncologist in Brescia University uh, with a lot of expertise in uh, head and neck cancer and doing trials in that, in that arena. Uh, while listening to what he has to say about pitfalls and challenges in trial design, especially for young investigators, try to think of one or two questions that you might want to ask him. And uh, if you do so, you can, you can put them in the chat or at the end of the session, we'll have a, a panel discussion and we can also try and if you raise your hand, give you the floor. But at least try to listen actively, try to think of your questions that we can jointly discuss afterwards. Uh, and, and with that, I think, Paolo, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Gabe. Thanks to all of you, to RTC, to the MCCR Alumni Club. It is really a pleasure to be here with all of you, uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be here also with Gabby, that, uh, with uh, whom I, I shared uh, uh, several meetings also in the RTC, and uh, because uh, we were both uh, early career investigators, but due to aging, uh, we are no more. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that I'm, we are no more early career investigators. So the, the, if the topics of today is thinking outside of the box in clinical trial designs, my um, task is to evaluate the pitfalls and challenges that can be faced by early career investigators in trial design. Please confirm that you can see my slide. Yes, we can, Paolo. Thank you. Wonderful. So let's go on. These are my declarations of interest. So let's start from the first point. Thinking outside of the box in clinical trial design. I do think that the first thing that is essential in this regard is the fact that uh, if you want to think outside of the box, you should remember to exactly know how the box is built. And this is, uh, I do think, essential to start uh, in such a reasoning. You, I do think that uh, all of you know the history of abstract painters, uh, of Kandinsky, of Pete Mondrian, and of Pablo Picasso, obviously. And you know that the, these most famous abstract painters had also a strong ability to paint in a realistic, in a naturalistic way. That means they know all the technical rules for a paintings before embarking in abstractism. So uh, moving the, the, the thoughts to another field, in order to think outside of the box, we should know how the box is built. The agenda of today, we will define uh, how to define a clear and structured hypothesis. We will have the challenge of defining primary endpoint, and uh, we will discuss the importance of patient reported outcomes, but also the importance of creating a network, how to incorporate translational research, and uh, lastly, the elephant in the room, the funding. So let's start uh, from how to define a clear and structured trial hypothesis. Just some simple suggestions. First, of, first, be ambitious. Do not think about small projects. Try to think of something that can be ambitious. And before all, before embarking in a new clinical trial, ask yourself whether, whether you would be interesting in, interested in reading the results of your trial when you have finished it. If so, please go on. If not, please change your main hypothesis. 
and do not limit your hypothesis to answer questions of limited utility. So this is like point one, be ambitious. Do not, do not think of, lim of uh, conf just conformatory trial. So think of something that can move research ahead. I know that sometimes uh, when you are starting a new trial, you can face the, the embarrass of being uh, um, in front of a sheet of blank paper. But I do think that this, this is the same, uh, this, this, these are the same thoughts that also Michelangelo had when he saw the first time the Sistine Chapels. And uh, all of us knew that, that uh, he was able to build this Sistine Chapel. So this should be uh, the end of our clinical trial. And how to define a structural uh, trial hypothesis? I do think that uh, it is important to try to tell a story, to be consistent with the, uh, your and our previous experiences. So do not think that to build something that is uh, too much outside your field of uh, expertise, because if uh, you are thinking of something that you are where you are not an expert, uh, this is something that uh, would not be a good uh, uh, would not have a good success. And also look at the literature in a meticulous way. Just to, to give an example, this is an example of one of my first trial when uh, when I started to to project uh, some clinical trials. The history, I would like to tell you the history of rank ligand in nasopharyngeal cancer. We know that nasopharyngeal cancer may evade, uh, may, may have distant metastasis as a main escape mechanism. And we also know from literature, and this is very important in order to, uh, to, to uh, stress the fact that it is important to uh, have a, a thorough evaluation of literature, that the bifosphonate showed a reduction not only in skeletal related events, but also in all sites, distant metastasization. And when I read the first time this thing, I was quite curious because uh, I was uh, interested in evaluating uh, which, could be, which could be the mechanisms for uh, this, uh, the reduction of distant metastasization. And the, the first hypothesis that I had was that there could be a possible role of, B, of uh, bifosphonate in immunomodulation. Then we also know that the rank ligand in tumor infiltrating in T-Rex has a role acting by suppressing the immune response. In particular, the immune response towards viral and cancer-related antigens. And nasopharyngeal cancer is a cancer due to a virus, the Epstein-Barr virus. So, uh, we, we were curious and we tried to evaluate the rank expression in metastasis of nasopharyngeal cancer. And these were the results. On the upper part, you can see the hematoxylin eosin uh, slides, and the lower part, the immuno, immunohistochemistry of rank ligand. So there is a quite uh, um, perfect uh, um, mirroring of uh, rank ligand with. Uh, the metastasis, these are metastasis in the lung, these are metastasis in the in, in a node, and these are lung metastasis. So you can see that the, 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 the color of rank ligand perfectly overlap with the, the sites of metastasis. So the hypothesis was that blocking rank ligand may exert an anti-tumoral effect by immunomodulation. So these were the concepts behind the DERN trial, so a trial with denosumab in EBV-related nasopharyngeal carcinoma. This was a model for the rank-mediated immunologic modulation of, uh, in general, virus-related tumors. And this is the scheme. Just, I don't want to go into details, but just to stress the fact that uh, by working with uh, an appealing uh, possible uh, um, background and with some hypothesis, you can build a trial also in a rare cancer. You can see by numbers that these are rare cancer. And we tried to add genosumab to, uh, in a randomized way and to evaluate uh, as a primary endpoint the change of uh, EBV DNA and the change in bioimmunological profile um, since baseline to the different cycles of treatment. 
So this trial was a, an example of how to build a, a clinical trial uh, leveraging on a strong background and on a good literature. There are other challenges in primary endpoints. The first is that, that it is important to know the difference between statistical significance and clinical relevance. This is a matter of size of effect, because if a new treatment is to be introduced into clinical practice, it should not be enough to show that it's better, generally better than the standard therapy, regardless of the size of its effect. This is a wonderful paper published 10 years ago by the Mario Negri group in Italy. The same group expressed that uh, it is uh, necessary to demonstrate that the effect is clinically worldwide. That means uh, that could be large or as large or larger than a specified threshold representing the minimally clinically worldwide effect. So try to uh, put into a clinical uh, experience uh, this, uh, this, this uh, uh, concept. Let's evaluate of the parable uh, of ramucirumab in urothelial carcinoma. This is, uh, was a presidential uh, symposium where this uh, trial, the range trial was presented, a trial with ramucirumab added to the cetaxel in the setting of uh, urothelial cancer progressing after a platinum regimen. This trial, according to the progression-free survival endpoint, that was the primary endpoint, was a statistically significant trial. But it, it was so stressed that the authors, and in conclusions of their presentation, said that the combination of ramucirumab and docetaxel is, in, in 2017, is a new treatment option for patients with platinum refractory advanced urotelial carcinoma. But if we see what happened just one year after, this was the same, um, the same presentation in the, at the same Congress, but in 2018, in the poster discussion session, the authors presented the, the overall survival uh, results of that trial. And they said that there was a trend toward an improved overall survival for patients treated with the, the combinations which did not meet statistical significance. So just 1.5 months more. So this is a perfect example of a, of a statistical uh, effect in PFS that did not translate in a meaningful clinical effect. So it is important to choose wisely the primary endpoint. And for instance, a primary rationale for using PFS, if you want to use PFS, because it is not prohibited to use PFS as a primary endpoint, but it's important to consider as a clinical benefit endpoint, PFS provided that the treatment effect is sufficiently large and that this, uh, this uh, improvement is not just an instrumental, but it, it is also a clinical benefit. And let's move to another interesting uh, topic, that is the importance of patient reported outcome measure. We all know that the PRO is a direct report of a patient condition. With whatever it will be, it, uh, it is sufficient that is not interpreted or modified from a clinician. And we know that the PROs are now considered as the gold standard for the assessment of subjective symptoms, both in clinical practice and clinical trials. But not more than three years ago, this other Italian group showed that there are many deficiencies in reporting health-related quality of life in randomized phase three trials, not in just in retrospective phase two trials. And they clearly and elegantly showed that uh, in the whole series of the, all the clinical trials, or the most clinical trials that they evaluated, quality of life was a primary endpoint just in 1%, the secondary endpoint in 43%, and just uh, an exploratory, and only an exploratory endpoint in 8% of the cases. That means that uh, one trial out of two did not have quality of life uh, in, in any in point of the trial itself. 
So quality of life in clinical research is very important because uh, uh, it is uh, essential in evaluating the benefit of a new clinical trial. And uh, in, in this regard, it's not surprising that both, both the ESCO and the ESMO magnitude of benefit scale included quality of life uh, as uh, one of the most important evaluation for uh, classifying the importance of the study results. Let's move to the, another important topic, that is the importance of creating a network. Just a few slides to the end of my, of my talk. It is important that, uh, to perform collaboration because, because collaboration may support you in defining the environment where to build your research. Cross-fertilization among different centers, among dif with different expertises and with different specialties is necessary to make your research fruitful. So do not think that your research can be uh, thought, can be um, built, and can be um, performed just in your center. So look outside of your single hospital. Because also the network of center may allow an adequate enrollment. It is important to think about a correct accrual rate before starting the trial. The network may limit also some problems. I would not uh, go into the details of this uh, uh, wonderful paper published by Jan Tenok uh, in Lancet Oncology that expressed the, all the possible problems that might limit the interpretation of randomized controlled trials. But I suggest to, to have a, a thorough, a thorough evaluation of this uh, paper because uh, it is a wonderful uh, uh, agenda of how to be aware of possible limits and how to overcome the limits of your future clinical trial. Translation research. It is important and is crucial, in particular, just uh, think about the arena of immune checkpoint inhibitors. All these can be evaluated as possible uh, factors uh, that can predict the response uh, of immune checkpoint inhibitors. However, in everyday clinical life, um, all the drugs are approved just uh, taking into consideration PDL1 expression or in a few cases, uh, the um, instability of microsatellite. So do you call this as precision immune oncology? I would not call this uh, as a pre precise, the treat precise treatment. So um, please, in your independent research, have a, a good uh, translation research in order to think outside of the box because it uh, it is clear it is uh, sometimes uh, somewhat normal that uh, uh, drug companies uh, would like to rely just on limited uh, predictive factor in uh, evaluating the response to immunotherapy but our mission our task is to evaluate in a more in a broader way well, the translational research just for example, here in immune checkpoint inhibitor use, but in general in the uh, cancer setting. And in particular, this is a, a, the comment of a, of a wonderful editorial, uh, just to see that uh, multivariate predictive models are very important in order to build large samples in multiple dimensions using machine learning. And in order to have uh, an, an adequate evaluation, for a comprehensive validation and evaluation of the results. And lastly, how to get your research funded? Is this the, is this the elephant in the room? And so I, I wrote that if you wait until now to have a response, you are an optimistic person because there is no magic result. Just persist, insist, and never give up. Create a network, build preliminary data, and be credible in your field. And then apply to national and international grants uh, but remembering to never give up and in particular be curious. So I would like to close with this uh, sentence of Karl Popper before starting uh, give, giving the, the button to uh, Gabe and to my colleague. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paolo. That was an excellent talk. Thank you so much. Uh, I would ask all participants to, to think about this and come up with questions which we will discuss jointly after the next talk uh, and the next talk will be by Daniela Morales and she is medical oncologist also mostly involved in lung cancer from Barcelona 
and uh, she will talk with us about what's outside say our classical thinking of phase one two three studies what's more to it and can we use that in our clinical research uh daniela happy to give you the floor hi thank you gabe thank you all for for being here thank you for uh, thank you, your DC and Mac, for for this space. So, as you mentioned, I'm a medical oncologist. Now, I am uh, I moved to the dark side, as we call it. I've been in in biotech for the last um, three months, so it's not that long. Um, I'm sorry, can you hold on? I wanted to avoid this kind of trouble, and in the end, I'm having the trouble. So, I'm sorry. <sighs> I did not want this to happen, actually. Hold on, bear with me for a second. Uh, in the meantime, I can tell you that um, it's um, um, so sorry. I have to hold on a second. I will. I'll be right back. I'm sorry. I'm reopening the, the presentation just a couple of seconds. Uh, I'll make up for your last time. <laughs> OK. So can you see my screen now? Yes, we can, Daniela. Go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> no problem. So well, what's beyond the classic uh, phase two three clinical trial design? Uh, it's not an easy thing to say, uh, but because there are so many things to it. And what I'm going to focus on is on adaptive trials, as you'll see. And I'll give you an example. This is my declaration of interest. And um, in here, I'm going to show you. Uh, we're going to speak only very briefly of the phases, you already know this. I'm going to focus, as I said, on adaptive designs, and I will now show you a case study, which is the iSpy. I chose this one because it's a more known and one of the really ground shakers that we had from the very beginning and some take home messages. So um, to start, uh, new drug development is not easy. It takes a lot of time and effort. As you can see, it's an average of 12 years before you get a drug uh, from the table where you're working on it until it gets it's approved and marketed, but that does not mean that every single one of the drugs that go through these tasks actually yeah, get approved. I don't see the slides proceeding. Maybe I'm the only one, but it doesn't move. I still see the title slide. No, the slides are not moving. Oh God, I'm so sorry. It had to I happen to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we can see it from. Uh, I mean. I can see the slides moving from our side. Same here. Yes, we can see the slides moving. Yes, me too. Yes, yeah, can yes, can. Yeah. So I'm here. I'm on the drug development slide. Can you see it? Yes, we. Yes. I can see it. Probably. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna move. Um, I'm gonna be off screen so that probably it doesn't get my bandwidth. So what I was trying to tell you is that. Um, it's about seven out of eight compounds, not the ones that actually get uh, marketed. It's seven out of eight that get ditched. So it is uh, important. And you have all these phases because each of them has a different uh, endpoint, a different uh, focus in depending on what they're looking for. It's the number of participants you would need and also the costs each of uh, them will have. So. Mainly all of them in the very beginning, you're only focusing on, on safety. That's the same concern all across, but efficacy, you start uh, testing in on phase two and three. So phase two becomes a very critical point to drug development. And I'll uh, go further on it a little bit more. So this is the body of the dead. I don't know if you've heard of it, but mm, what I wanted to explain you here is that we're here with our ideas and then we have our patients that actually give us our ideas, but in order to get from here to here, it's a lot of hurdles you have to pass, mainly because uh, not all goes with big pharma. We also have a smaller pharma and, and, and biotechs and so on. And 
they depend on the investors in it's become very difficult to raise funds to bring promising drugs from here to here because they take very seriously the risks that are associated with the failure of such uh, drugs in a clinical trial. So, uh, so we have to make our trials better. And if you see, as I mentioned, the phase two is critical. It's because you see the, the success rate, the blue ones are the oncology ones. Um, the success rate in a phase one to phase two is about 60%. But when you go on a phase two, up to a phase three, that rate drops dramatically up to 20 something percent. And that's something that means that maybe we're making this filter not good enough. Uh, and we're putting on this phase drugs that should not be there to start with. In other words, you have phase one results that look very robust and, and, and you're proud of them. Then phase two, well, they're starting to look very good yet, but not as robust as they were. And then when you're in phase three, you're almost skinny dipping. So uh, with this, we're, I'm gonna move to the adaptive uh, study designs uh, because one size does not fit all. And that applies to everything related to trial, um, patients, diseases, and biomarkers, the trial design itself, and so on. These trials were uh, mainly designed as means to increase the efficacy. Um, they benefit uh, uh, the efficacy of randomized controlled trials because um, that's the classic design, that's what you would go traditionally for registration, and they're not as good uh, in terms of getting you where you want. So with these designs, you would think of benefiting the trial participants and those that are not participating in the trial, you would reduce costs, therefore making it more uh, feasible to, to move these drugs. You enhance the likelihood of finding a true benefit if there is any with your drug, and it applies to both exploratory and confirmatory uh, clinical trials. I will focus on the confirmatory ones. And well, in this, um, what is it? It means that we are, um, we have changes that we are prospectively planning uh, in the future course of the trial that we have ongoing. And the difference is that we're not waiting for a phase three trial to pass years and years and years to end, but we're nurturing the trial based on the analysis of the trial itself. And it works for fully blinded, unblinded, and it does not um, take validity of a way of your conclusions. There are many categories you may see in so many seamless phase two, three uh, designs, et cetera. And, but before I get there, I'm gonna give you two key concepts that I will talk about a little bit later. I will mention them in the iSpy. And one is that it's very important to use master protocols. And what are master protocols? It's a master protocols are unifying study that includes multiple subgroups and sub studies in patients who may have one or many diseases. And you may be already very familiar with them, such as the basket trial, where you have drug A in many diseases or a disease with many other ones, such as in the umbrella trials and platform trials, where this is pretty much where, where the iSpy uh, trial is. And Bayesian randomization, you hear of this a lot. In, in terms of, of actually patients included in the trial, what it means is that you are assessing your marker, you are randomizing your, your population. The, topper, the upper part is a traditional design, and then the lower part is um, what you have in, a, in an adaptive randomization. And in here, instead of having your patients randomized on a one-on-one -on -one ratio, and then besides seeing, let's think of an unblinded trial, besides seeing the patient um, that the drug might not be so good, you're still randomizing them to that. And with this kind of design, you increase their chances to get this kind of therapy, two to one, three to one, and so on, okay? So just keep that in mind. So move to the iSpy. What they have as a mantra is the right drug for the right patient at the right time, and that right, right time is now. They have already over 1,400 patients enrolled, and some drugs have already uh, finished the evaluation under this study, and some even got accelerated approval. Uh, where it got from? Well, you have here the idea begun in 1998 by Dr. Laura Esserman at UCSF and Dr. Nola Hilton. Dr. Esserman is a breast surgeon and Dr. Nola Hilton is a imaging, uh, breast imaging specialist. So uh, 
first of all, I would like to say that I love the acronym of this trial because it's investigation of serial studies to predict your therapeutic response with imaging and molecular analysis. And in the end, we're all spying the disease and how the drugs do. They found four main inefficiencies in the way uh, randomized clinical trials were conducted. Mainly, they were uh, focusing on metastatic uh, patients, which we know the disease is treatable but not curable as, it, as of today. Uh, they were uh, limited to use of adjuvant treatment, therefore you have to wait for the recurrence-free survival, which adds five to seven years to your waiting period to analyze a trial. And there were not too many biomarkers analyzed. It was mainly hormonal and HER2. Uh, also because of the time it was, and now we're kind of moving in different directions, but that's what set it up. And also the traditional randomized clinical trial structure, as uh, Paul mentioned and, and in the past, is that it's not always morally right to keep on, on including patients to a study you think it's not doing so well, but also not having other trials to include patients in. So this is, first they had to set grounds for it in to get the phase two study. So they did the, the phase one, as to call it, as a proof of concept. They proved that the pathological complete response, this is breast cancer, remember, uh, is an effective predictor of the uh, relapse free survival. And they had a very good uh, definition of imaging and biomarkers they would be testing, and they built a huge uh, network, which also was mentioned by my, my colleague before my talk, that it's important to have a, uh, a strong net network in order to get where you want. So another thing that's important, then they moved to the phase two, the iSPY2, and it's adaptive uh, clinical trial design. It's a mix between basket and platform trials, and it's patient uh, center trial, which is very important. And you can see the patient is at the center of everything and the clinical trial process, the informatics and everything, the core is the patient or are the patient. So as I always think of, it's not what you have or what you do, but what you know, what they have and what they do. So you really need a good team. It's very important to have people involved in your study that might help you it. So. And in this case, Dr. Esmerman and, 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 and Dr. Heldon had uh, involved Dr. Whitcock, who actually worked at the FDA. Um, at the time, she was also working there. Then they had uh, Dr. Anna Barker, who was um, the deputy director of the National Cancer Institute in the United States at the time, but also in one thing that was one of my take home messages from, from MCCR, is that you always, if you don't have one, you're late, <laughs> you start looking for one, you really need a good biostatistician to be your friend and who you can trust, that they can teach you, they can guide you, you can discuss things with them, but it's crucial to have them involved in every step of a trial when you are starting to do it. So this was innovative because remember, they, they are focusing on the neoadjuvant setting and by the time they launch, think of it, 2009, there were not so many trials in the neoadjuvant setting. So um, it was kind of um, very um, innovative and not so many people were for it. It was very controversial, controversial until they started seeing the results. This is a study schema. I will not go into it, but just keep in mind that uh, they have biomarkers and they're moving forward. So it's a way in which they are uh, it, it's a continuous learning process because you, drugs may enter or exit the trial as a, the study moves. You see, you can continuously learn and you can you have the termination rules. So you, either the drug graduates or you stop the drug because you, you see it's not useful or you let it continue because you're still not there yet, but it has not shown any harm. And Another of the uh, good things they have is that they have a biomarker focus that, that enabled to develop and enhance them even more and, and look beyond what they had on, on, on hormone receptors in HER2. And one thing that's very important is that you have a lot of experts, but you have experts take care of what they really know. Therefore, they will be adding you the most value. And again, a multi-center -center collaboration. Um, another thing of the organizational structure that I think it's important to, to highlight is, in addition to the data management that was awesome or is often, and the managing platform is the risk-based monitoring. Why? Because trials get so long and you gather so much data that when the time comes and, and the trial ends, there are so many things to analyze and that it might even add more time to the study uh, potentially. So with this risk-based uh, monitoring, they start to clean 
the data in real time and then they filter for AEs that are significant to the results of the trial or they update randomization as it comes. In the regulatory arena, uh, this is what I mentioned, uh, the master protocol has been very helpful for this study because they have a general protocol of, you know, of trial procedures, same with the IND application, and then what they do is they only edit the appendix every time a new drug enters the trial. That way they don't have to stop patient accrual, they don't have to resrupt it, they don't have uh, to eliminate, they don't have to wait for the 30-day uh, FDA uh, review period for the trial, and then uh, the trial is more time efficient. So since 2010, when they started the trial, some drugs have already graduated, some dropped, and yet Across the study, the probability, uh, predicted probability, which makes a drug uh, graduate, remains 85 percent 80, or higher. And as an example, I can show you this. Uh, the first drug that graduated was neurotinib. It took it 35 months in the ISPY2 study, but that does not apply to all the drugs. You can see that, for instance, uh, pembrolizumab, Keytruda, it only spent 12 months in the trial before it graduated to a phase three, and then the results were um, were pretty much consistent to what they were seeing here. Uh, this has been uh, important and has attracted more of the companies uh, to bring their drugs because one thing you have to, to take into consideration is that this trial is focused on the patients and the disease and what they are doing, but it's not focused on every single drug. And these drugs, they mean hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, millions of in investment in each of them. So it might be very difficult to get uh, all the people that is involved to simply let go of the control and, and share it with everybody else. Um, as of today, you can see there are the drugs that have, not every drug has got graduated. As mentioned, some have already been uh, ditched and some are waiting to be included. And the trial keeps on moving. And it's also called, this kind of trials are also called the never ending studies because they just keep on, on moving. And so what's next? So to think of it, this, this kind of design, the iSpy, has been an inspiration for other trials to start, but not only in the oncologic arena. So this started in 2010, it was mainly phase two, but ever since you can see that uh, now there's a precision promise from for pancreatic cancer patients. And it's uh, innovative again from what this was because it's now a phase two, three trial. Also for other diseases such as Alzheimer's and uh, Ebola, and, and some others. This is just a, a selection of a few. So to keep uh, in mind. And also another thing uh, that you need to remember is that the ISPY was an academic initiated trial. So the investigators are the ones that came up with the idea. They came, initially it was funded by, by philanthropists that gave the money to it before they properly raised money for it and more pharma came and, and et cetera, et cetera. So no idea is small, so keep that in mind. And finally, my take home messages, don't limit yourself to traditional designs. Uh, to think outside the box, you really need to know well the box. Never forget who you are doing this for, which is your patients mainly, and the formula for success, which is not 100%. Always have a great team, and in that, always, always, always have a good, a good biostatistician you trust and learn from them. That will help you have a good trial design and a well written protocol. And after this, I'm sure, I hope you start looking at adaptive trials as a a different thing and, and not such a, uh, a strange resource to run to. So that's all from my side and I'm sorry for the technical uh, difficulties we have. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Daniela. That was, that was a great talk indeed and very, very informative to see the iSpy result or the iSpy uh, design. Um, so this will be the time to, to put your questions in the chat. Uh, I see one question we will come back to, uh, or you raise your hand and uh, and I'll give you the microphone, or you can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question to uh, to these speakers. Uh, may, maybe Daniel, to start off, there's a question from Rodrigo Taboada, and and basically what he's asking is if you if you do a basket trial, or, or I, I think even any trial that you involve many of various uh, companies with, do you have any thoughts on how to overcome the differences uh, between the companies and have them all involved? Yeah, well, that's not not easy as you would expect, in, but it's not impossible as you see with the iSpy. It's a, you just need to have a solid design and 
with the numbers I gave you, just look at the difference. There's uh, there's a five percent uh, success rate for in general oncology trials from phase one to to the end. And if you see uh, with this approach of adapting the design, you start uh, making it more likely for these drugs to graduate. So it it all depends on how you present it. And probably you will have, I mean, uh, thankfully there's not, of course there are the drugs everybody wants to work with. I know that <laughs> because I chased a company for my trial like for two years or so. And in the end you talk to the right person. So as, as Paula said, never stop. Keep on, on asking them. In, and if you find a closed door, then there's another one that will open. But also you need to, to explain to them all with the statistical background that will um, um, make the, the, a solid basis for your trial. If you have a strong basis and a way to explain it to them that, okay, you have things to lose, but you also have many things to, to win. You would save a lot of money. For instance, in a phase three, you would have to include nearly over hundreds of patients. And if you look at these trials, and none of them has needed uh, more than 150 patients or so to graduate from the phase, uh, the ISPY2. So that's a lot of money you're saving because trials are seriously expensive because all the, the things you have to do also because of all the uh, the um, amendments you have to do to the protocols and so on. Every time you would need to add a drug. So you have to be very hard as Paula said, you have to know the disease because you have to know the science behind it. And then with strong background, then you can present it. And there are similar type drugs, as I said, there's not only one company that has immunotherapy. There's not only one company that has a specific TKI against AKT or whatever it is you're, you're thinking of. So look at what's there and, and approach different companies. Probably one thing would be uh, to look for not only big pharma, but uh, medium-sized biotechs because they have the least to lose and a lot to win. Uh, I don't know if I make myself clear on this. I, I think that's very helpful. Yeah, Paula, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I do think that uh, what Daniela was expressing is, is, a, is a, a, a critical and crucial point. Because when we, we have a, a, such a trial design, we should build an um, environment where there could be a win-win situation. So a win situation for the pharma company that can see in you as a researcher, a good clinical researcher with a strong reputation with the in a good environment, and the RTC is the perfect environment for this. And on the other side, the researcher, you as a researcher, you should gain the opportunity to test new drugs. The new drugs, not uh, obvious or just because it is a new drug that should be tested, but because this corresponds to your uh, previous uh, researchers, to the researches, and uh, corresponds to the hypothesis that you have built before in order to test this drug. So the, the, the critical point is to build an environment where there could be a win-win situation. Thank you. Um, just just waiting to see if there's any other questions in the chat. Maybe, maybe Paolo, can you can you expand a little on say the value of of ERTC, for instance, or other uh, joint groups? Uh, when when will you when will you go to say ERTC if you have a trial? When do you think it would be better for a a, a well a, a national study? Can you can you elaborate on that? So this is a this is a should should need a, at least a, a, a full seminar for this. But I do think that the, the most important thing is thinking about your TC as a platform, as an environment where there are several brains. The, uh, in particular, within the, the disease-oriented groups, you can see a special environment where you can see all the specialties that are represented and that uh, expresses the, the most important knowledge about the, the, that specific cancer. And this is an, a, 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 an extraordinary occasion to find uh, an environment where to build your research. 
In particular, if you speak about a rare cancer, this is uh, the, the optimal environment because uh, such such rare cancer, in particular with the adaptive design that uh, Daniela was uh, was explaining, this is the the environment where you could uh, benefit uh, in, uh, for building your trial. There are also the possibility to move in a national setting because this is very important also. I prefer to stay in a national setting when there is, a, um, I can, can, how can I explain, just a, a, a small question to move ahead. And I would like to build something that should be then uh, moved to, an, uh, to a more uh, uh, particular, to a, more, or to a broader arena and to a broader context. So I do think that uh, uh, RTC is a really good environment, uh, but before this, uh, you should have a stronger rational and a strong hypothesis, a strong preliminary data. Yeah, thank you. And well, maybe to add to that, that the ERTC has, has so much expertise also on a statistical point of view and, uh, of course, also contact with many industries. So if, if you're short on that or you want to have more information, I think ERTC would be a good place to go to as well. Uh, Daniela, maybe maybe from another perspective, we, we you talk that patient, the patient should be in the center. What, what's your experience or what, what advice can you give on working with patient advocacy groups and how to involve them in your trial design in the, in the conduct of the trial? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, advocacy groups have gained a lot of, of protagonism over the, late, of the last years. And one thing is because uh, there has been a demand for uh, greater access to information. And I have a personal experience with the melanoma cancer uh, advocacy group, as all of us in, uh, at MCCR, I think we do. Um, and it's very good to have them involved because uh, they talk to each other and they look to each other for information and they tell you know there's this trial and they make the impact of your study uh, bigger and also uh, you might see what's missing so it's not always easy to get them uh, where you think because everybody has their own interests and we have still there are regulatory constraints that are uh, we're bounded to and many other guidelines that we have to to follow but it's very important to to consider them and most of them will will be willing to to provide you with with their input and their idea and their experiences and you might gain for that uh, for instance how do they see because it happened one time when i was discussing a trial in with a potential drug and then um, as an investigator, you say, well, it's not so bad if the you have a grade one asthenia in the study or grade two, and then you speak to these um, advocacy groups and they say, you know what, it really sucks to be feeling so tired all the time. And that's one of the reasons I stop X, Y, or Z drug. And as physicians, we usually don't look at that. Oh, it's only grade one asthenia, grade two. It's only, you need the other focus so that you can better define how are you going to measure things? How are you going to approach it? And it, it will certainly nurture your trial. Some of them are, are very um, open and working and have a stronger network such as the melanoma patient group. But others uh, are in the growth such as a lung cancer one from it's very related to uh, ISLC. And there are many other uh, that others that are popping up. So if you have a specific interest in a specific type of malignancy, reach out to them. They're more than happy to to be involved in this, more than we actually expected it to be. Yeah, Paolo, you, your experience there? Yes, I do think that is uh, important was what you were speaking about. Uh, having a patient representative since the beginning of, uh, of, the, of building a new trial is essential because they can really uh, see, they can really show you another point of view. Just an example, we were uh, uh, preparing a trial with the nurse management, uh, in a national trial with the nurse management of adverse events. We were uh, thinking about uh, the primary endpoint and we, we thought that the primary point as the intensity, the severity of adverse event could be a good primary point because if, you, if we would like to reduce the severity of an adverse events, this could be really a, a huge a huge effort for, for the trial. When you spoke to the patient representative, they expressed us the, the importance of considering also the time length. So they told us that the, the severity is important, but 
but the duration of adverse events is another crucial point for the patient. The classical example that they, they, they make is the fact if, if you prefer to have a grade three diarrhea for three days or a grade one diarrhea for one month. So just, this is just a simple example, but looking on the other side of, of the moon, that is the, the, the principal actor of our trial is really important. And having them on board since the beginning, but also in the interpretation of the trial is crucial. Let's just make a, another example. When I see some results of the trial that uh, put uh, in the adverse event and they divide adverse event as asthenia or as fatigue, I would really question and claim what is the difference for a patient uh, between asthenia and fatigue. Please ask your patient, uh, are you asthenic or are you fatigued? Is there any difference on this? On this? And these are just interpretation of the physician. Uh, of the physicians about the, this uh, adverse event. But the most important thing is that to ask the patient, to listen to the patient voices and to have their, uh, their, uh, in career, their opinions back in order to build and to interpret your trial. Thank, thanks so much. And, and maybe to add from my own view is that Patient ambassadors or patient advocacy groups can also be real ambassadors for your trial and, and help accrual and help motivate other patients to be involved. And I think that's that's also a very important aspect of, of patient involvement, patient advocacy involvement. Uh, Paolo, maybe for you one, one other question. You, you mentioned the importance of choosing your primary endpoints wisely and you also mentioned the ASMO magnitude of clinical benefit scale. Uh, do, do you look at the magnitude of the, the MCBS to, to decide what kind of effect you're aiming for or what kind of endpoint you're choosing? To be honest, not in every trial I've been designing, but it's something that uh, I have uh, uh, questioned my, uh, in something which I've questioned myself before starting a new trials since now to, to, to the, for the future. Because I do think that uh, having in mind what could be the results in particular, what would be the impact of the results of a trial. When I was younger, I would, I would be satisfied of having just a, a P of a, um, 0 0.05. Now I would like to, to be informed of, a, of a, the importance of the, my, of the results of my trial in the clinical, uh, in the clinical arena. Exactly, as you mentioned, the difference between significance and relevance. And I think the ESMO MCBS and, and their other scales are very, very instrumental in, in helping you to decide what kind of trial or what size of trial you would need and what kind of endpoints are important, and especially in, in involving patient-related uh, outcomes as well. Um, I think we're running towards the end of the, of the hour. I don't see any questions or hands raised. Uh, so I think I hope this was this was helpful for you. I think we had two excellent speakers and giving them their insights. If I may, I'd like to, to add just three things from my own view and, and, and share with you to think outside the box. I think we, we want to do innovative trials. We don't want to do a, a, a copycat trials. So and, and one of the things I find very helpful is to expand your horizon and, and, and go to meetings with other scientists outside your own field go to, to meetings with psychologists or to statisticians or things that you don't hear every every day. And, and that can really help to cross fertilate each other and come up with new ideas. Uh, I think that would be one. And uh, one other thing that I've experienced is uh, many times I see trial designs that try to answer like six or seven questions in eight subgroups and they're, they're, they're bound to have difficult accrual. Uh, imagine that if you come up with a trial that tries to answer all, all, all the questions, your colleagues in the in the outpatient department having little time have to explain the trial to a patient. And the simpler the design is and the simpler that explanation will be, the more likely a patient will enter the trial. So simplicity is really related to accrual. Uh, and then I think the third thing, and it was mentioned a couple of times before, team science is key. Uh, it, it, uh, share the, 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 the workload, share the successes, and it's it just much more fun as well. So, so really make yourself happy. It, it's, it's so much better to have team science. And I think with those three, uh, we'll come to end of the meeting. I'd like to thank Daniela, Paolo, 
uh, definitely also Sabine Downskötter and Gwydion Lin for helping us in, in organizing this. I'd uh, like to thank ERTC uh, for, for organizing the, uh, the webinar. Gwydion actually said two things in the chat you may have a look at on, on the MCCR uh, workshop that uh, unfortunately was postponed due to COVID, but there will be new opportunities and, and please have a look out for that. And also, if you want to be involved with EOTC, become a, a member or expanding your membership or renewing your membership, or are you interested in participating in, in, uh, in groups, please stay contact. Um, well, with that, I think I thank all of you for participating. Uh, this was a great hour. Thank you so much and hope to see you again in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.